Hello and welcome to Ireland County by County, exploring the sights and sound, the travel, the food, the culture of this amazing country. This time we're in the southeast, in a Viking county. In this episode, I'll be discovering a thousand years of history in just a thousand paces. Finding out how the world's most famous crystal is made. I'll be strolling along some of the wildest and most picturesque trails and open spaces in the country. Visiting some of the most spectacular gardens anywhere in Europe and exploring the extraordinary links between this county with no less an enduring star of the silver screen than Fred Astaire. Welcome to County Waterford. Waterford dates its history back to 853. The Vikings from the south of Scandinavia would launch attacks on the southeast part of Ireland all the time, and so the Viking settlements and defence forts grew into what is now a modern and thriving city. More on the Vikings later. Waterford is one of those places that geographically can boast a bit of everything. An extraordinary and internationally recognised beach coastline, dramatic mountainous terrain in the west of the county, and wherever you go, there's always something to see or do. I'm beginning my journey right in the centre of the county and along the coast. 17 of Ireland's 32 counties have a coastline of some sort, but Waterford can boast something special. In 2004, a stretch of 16 miles of Waterford coastline was declared a UNESCO Global Geopark, one of only 150 across the world. I have a feeling I'm going to be doing a lot of walking on this trip and where better to begin than here. We are on our way to the Cumra Mountains, which is a part of Waterford which boasts some of the best green walkways anywhere in Ireland. Today's mission is to find the Matting Falls. Waterford is so famous for its coast, but people need to come inland. This is stunning. When you come inland, you nearly leave the world as you know it behind when you come up here. Look at this. 300 million years ago, imagine this big, large ball of snow, and it meandered its way from source up there to where the falls are now, worked its way down the valley here, the whole way down. We're going to follow the river's flow today, later on, and just work our way down. You can see the woods there, and then onto the sea beyond. It's like a cathedral of stone out here. It's just, you're away from everything. A sort of kaleidoscope of rock. Well, I think it's just amazing. We literally we have a place to ourselves. It's you and a few sheep. <laughs> <laughs> right, will we get a walk? Let's okay. go, let's do it. Suddenly sitting here, I feel very, very small. I suddenly feel words are powerless, to be honest. There's nothing else you can say. This is just something special. We are small and we're surrounded by stone and cascading waters, but yet up here you feel the miniature matters too, the small microscopic matters. Our little lives actually matter in this grand scheme of things, believe it or not. And that's it, you're looking at the falls in the distance and you see these tiny sheep and you just realise how massive this place is. And this falls rolls from here now. This is source and it meanders its way through the valley, down through beautiful woods below and on out to the ocean. We call it our walk to the river's flow from source to the sea. And it's just amazing when you take that path, something of the stillness and the peace of this place sort of seeps into you and you, you feel the better for it when you get home that night. Wow, and the water gets so much louder when you get closer as well. Take a little moment to yourself down here in Arkira. So this is your favourite spot? This is my favourite spot. There's nowhere more peaceful that I can think of than here. And the Camino of Life, you need to stand still now and again and just soak in the beauty and peace of these places. And our groups love nothing more than just to take a rock, take time and just chill. And when they're ready, they're ready. We're going to move on downstream now. We're going to go to Kilmac Thomas. Uh, this passes under a viaduct and you really can't come to Waterford without seeing the River Mahan roll beneath the viaduct. 
About a 40 minute drive from the falls is one of the most spectacular constructions anywhere in Ireland. Lismore Castle. Lismore was originally built by the English King John in 1185. It was owned in turn by Sir Walter Raleigh and Richard Boyle before passing to the fourth Duke of Devonshire in 1753. And Charles Cavendish, the son of the ninth Duke, married into entertainment royalty. His wife was Adele, the sister and dance partner of the legendary Fred Astaire. And if you're looking for history, Lismore Castle is steeped in it. The Duke of Devonshire is one of only 24 non-royal dukes in Britain and the title has been around for hundreds of years. I started here back in 1977. I came down here for a summer job. And of course, back then, Adele Astaire and Lord Charles Cavendish had it as their family home. They were given it as a wedding gift in 1932 when they married. Although it's a big castle, it is, after all, a family home. That's what I love about the place. When you're driving up, it's absolutely huge and really imposing, but you walk in the door and it's just so cozy. Remember my first view of the castle when I came here many, many years ago, uh, it was exactly that. And Robert Boyle, the scientist, the father of modern chemistry, he was born here in Lismore Castle in 1627. And tell me, Dennis, you've had a fair few famous guests. I suppose one of the most uh, famous visitors uh, in his time uh, would have been John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy's sister, Kathleen, of course, she was known as Kiki Kennedy. She married Billy Cavendish uh, in May of 1944. Billy Cavendish was in line to become the 11th Duke of Devonshire. But five weeks after they married, he was called off to war. And sadly, in September of that year, he was killed in action uh, in Belgium. And she was based in London, and of course, she used to come across here to Lismore. We've had Prince Charles, he came over here. He came for the present Duke's uh, 60th birthday. And he stayed here for three days and enjoyed a trek up on the mountains and walking around the town and meeting with some locals in the banqueting hall and all of that. There's so many beautiful paintings. The one here, is that, that's the castle itself, is it? The American artist, Nicholas de Molas, he painted it in 1933. It's of Lord Charles Cavendish and his new wife, Adela Stair. And they're sitting in the inches in front of the castle. And he's presenting her, I think, with the first salmon of the season that year. Being in the castle every day, do you get used to it? Getting used to it is one thing, but taking it for granted is another. I never, ever take it for granted. And even now, some days, when I look in some corner of the building or look out, look out from the roof or whatever it might be, um, I see things that I haven't seen before, you know. You've had so many great visitors and I've heard you have a visitor's book with a couple of famous ones in it. So we have a number of visitor's book that they go back, you know, uh, generations, of course. Like say, for instance, our friend Fred Astaire. Now, Adele Astaire, his sister, loved to entertain, um, but she had a rule and the rule was that, you know, um, guests stay for four days and no more. Um, but Fred always, uh, you know, stayed for much, much longer than that. There's one entry where he wrote uh, in how he enjoyed himself from the middle of May to almost the end of June. And as he drove out the avenue, his sister added a little P.S. She said, I thought he'd never leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of them. And there's another one here. Come in, look, there it goes. Oh, yes. And where's... And this is uh, Charles. <laughs> what does that say? That's how say? he signs it. Okay, I can't make that out at all. It's, it's you... just simply Charles. Oh, it uh, is, yeah, yeah. Charles. Sure, what? Yeah. You wouldn't need anything else, really, when I you're a prince, yeah, would you? exactly. The gardens at Lismore are said to be the oldest continually cultivated gardens in Ireland. And if it's gardens you're after, you'll be spoiled for choice in Waterford. I'm visiting the gardens at Mount Congreve. The gardens and the house were originally built in the 1740s. The land was purchased off the local council and the first of the Congreves, John Congreve, commissioned the local architect, John Roberts, who designed both cathedrals in the city to build his house on the banks of the River Shore. And you're managing the gardens. Do you have a favourite spot? My favourite part of the garden is the maple lawn for late autumn or fall as it's known in the States because um, it was built for Mr Congreve's wife who was from Virginia to remind her of the colours in the fall. So that's my own favourite part. Could we go and have a look at those maple lawns? We'll go up and have a look at it, yeah. Oh, completely different, isn't completely it? Different. Very very formal. Formal. Completely different. Very enclosed. Very formal, very enclosed. You have what we call our infinity lawn. There would have been a bell on this gate years ago, so when the owner would come down, the bell would ring. The head gardener would know 
go and talk to the owner. All the other gardeners would know to hide, jump under bushes, just don't be seen. And that's the way it was. And did that used to happen then when you were working here with Mr Congreve? Oh yes, very much so. He rode around on his horse around the estate up until his early 90s. So we would hear him coming. And you would, depending on what humour you knew he was in, because it was like the bush telegraph would go around and you would know whether you should hide or not. That's what we would all do. But he'd still calm down and he'd find you and he'd ask, what's the name of this plant? What's the name of that plant? Always challenge you to learn more all the time. In the greenhouse, we do tours in there and we give classes in there. On the far side, we would grow grapes that have been there about 150 years. And the gate. The gate here leads out onto the greenway. Okay, will we have a look? Yeah. The train is probably the easiest way to do the greenway, but um, you can cycle it as well. Oh yeah, you should cycle it. But the train goes from the village of Kilmeadon in as far as the bridge for us. Is it true that you've had a visitor in the river for the last couple of months? We've had a dolphin out here and many people witnessed it because the river is tidal, probably up as far as Port Law. But yes, dolphins come now and that's at least the second year, if not the third year, he's been here. So we're looking forward to seeing him again as well next year. You'll also find spectacular gardens at Curramore House. 2,500 acres of formal gardens, woodland and grazing fields make this the largest private domain in Ireland. And the Lafcadio Hearn Japanese Gardens which include an American garden, a Greek garden, and a traditional Japanese tea garden, in addition to a stream garden, ponds, a waterfall, and an extensive woodland area. Next up on our journey is the fishing village of Ardmore, where I'm hoping to catch fresh lobster with a little help from local fisherman Michael. We're looking for lobsters. Okay. So I'm going to haul a few Pots here now. Oh, oh there's a fine fell in this. Amazing. Put in the box here. Okay. Like that, and I put the bag over them. Keep them from fighting with another fella if I get another fella. Well, I sell them to the Cliff House Hotel, Rich and Star Restaurant. They take them off me. Okay, two in here. Now. They're in his eye here. Okay. And back to the start of the tail, so well over the size. Brilliant. But he's a different colour lobster. He's way lighter. Okay, what does that mean? This one is black and this one is more bluey. Yeah, it's got a blue tinge. And are they different species or no, just different colour? Just... No, they're the same species, it's just that one is lighter than the other. I love the sea. I love it. And are you from a family of fishermen? Well, my uncle was a fisherman. He just lived above the pier and he's got two in this one. So you've taken the bait out, you've put the fresh bait in, you're, you're putting them back in, and yeah. then you'll be back when in a few days to in check? In two or three days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think the crab meat is nicer than the lobster, but I eat both. Two or three months a week I'd have crab for my breakfast. Oh, nice. You go walking for 20, 30 years, you'll always come back to the sea. It's something in the blood. And if you like it here, check out Dungarvan, which boasts one of the most beautiful harbours in the country. I'm on my way to meet Marie, who's going to tell me all about seaweed harvesting. We're going to hopefully find some dillisk, also known as dulse. We're going to find hopefully sea lettuce, some kelp, bladder racks, low corn, maybe even some carrageen mast. The ones we're going to find today have got a distinctive taste, are a very strong nutrient profile, are a really practical use, such as medicinal cures for coughs and colds. All seaweeds contain iodine, and iodine is a very important nutrient for metabolism and for your immune system. All seaweeds contain protein. Some of them are as high as 20% protein, so they're a really good source of plant protein. And then they contain a range of minerals and vitamins, calcium, iron, zinc, magnesium, manganese, Dillisk is often used in conjunction with uh, lobster because it's such a beautiful colour and also because of that sort of smoky flavour um, it can make a really nice addition to a, to a bisque and, and so on. Sea lettuce is um, again a good source of protein. Do you want a little taste of that there? Because it's so thin, I mean it's just about two cells thick, you can see even the light coming through. 
see little holes where some of the snails have been eating it already on the cover. I hope we didn't give you a snaily bit, Marie. No, I didn't give <laughs> a snaily bit. It does remind us, though, that we're not the only ones using this and that it's, you know, it's part of a bigger ecosystem. Mm. That little one there, chefs love using it as well. It's worth, and it's worth tasting. What's it's that one called? It's pepperdillus. I'll have a quick taste of that as well. Have a little taste. And Joe, you know I'm, I'm so impressed with how they taste raw that I'm really nice and meaty and flavoursome, isn't it? Very flavoursome, mm. yeah. And where better to prepare my fresh lobster and seaweed than at the Michelin Star restaurant at the Cliff House Hotel. Ian, I've been busy hauling lobster and foraging seaweed and I thought the best man in Waterford to bring it to would be you. What are you planning on doing with all this great produce? Yeah, we're just going to take the lobster and uh, grill it here on our barbecue. We brush it first with uh, smoked butter. Tell me about Waterford. Like, it's absolutely stunning, but it's a pretty good location for Irish produce as well, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we have fantastic. We get the lobsters here from local. We're going to make a sauce now from the carrots that are grown in the field over there. We actually serve the tail in the restaurant, and then we break down the claws, and we serve it in our seafood gratin in the bar. So we use everything. We use the shells for sauces and things like that. And is it tricky to cook with the lobster? Fish is always difficult, because when you cook with meat, 10 seconds is uh, not as important, but five seconds with fish is a lifetime. Waterford has been named the number one foodie destination, and it's easy to see why. Should take a bit of the seaweed then as well. Yeah, try a bit of everything. You could say that this is our more on a plate. As stunning as it is out here, you know, I think it would be a shame for me not to go and taste the lobster in the Michelin Star restaurant. Thank you. If you're not lucky enough to have Ian personally cook your lobster for you on the terrace, you can come into the Michelin Star house restaurant at the cliff. Two things which you can't miss in Waterford are the Waterford Greenway and the Shore Valley Railway. When you're finished exploring the county, the city of Waterford is right at the heart of the action. And they say that within a thousand paces, you can explore a thousand years of history. I'm going to learn more about the Viking history of Waterford with a little help from Bart the Viking and the world's first Viking virtual reality tour. You can dive underwater as well and see a Viking longboat, wreckage, fish. You can also see birds in the sky. Will, will we have a look? Would you mind if I try it? Yes, if you're not afraid of dead bodies in the water. Yeah, After no. the bottle? No. No? no. Good. So please sit down. So first, the headset. Okay, so I can just see the room as it is. I believe it's this. Is, is that the same house? So let me give you the authentic Viking headphones. Okay, I don't feel claustrophobic. Without horns, unfortunately, <laughs> but Vikings never wore horn helmets. Did they not? Of course not. Imagine them running with horn helmets into battle. That would be funny. <laughs> Are you ready to start your adventure? Not really, but anyway. Go you on. have no choice. <laughs> Let's go. Just wait a few seconds. You're going to jump. On the left, there should be a Viking longboat. I'm such a wuss. I want to close my eyes. And enjoy your, enjoy your meal. Oh, guys, there's all dead bodies and everything. This is terrible. I have to close my eyes. This is too much. Bart, you didn't tell me there was going to be dead bodies. Actually, you did tell me there was going to be dead bodies. Exactly. It's like I wasn't even in this room anymore. You traveled through time and space. Yeah, literally a, a thousand years. Wow. Exactly. One thousand years in 20 minutes. Yeah. Next door to the Viking Centre is the Waterford Medieval Museum. I mean, this is part of the medieval museum, but where exactly are we? 
Well, we're right here in Watford, Ireland's oldest city, and this building dates from the 1280s. The dean that lived here from 1440 to 1483 very cleverly wrote a book. And one of the fascinating things about the dean who lived here, his name was John Collin, was that he ordered these absolutely magnificent vestments. And as most people don't know a little bit about Irish history, know that most things were destroyed in the Reformation by Cromwell, but these were buried to keep them safe. The man who buried these wonderful vestments died and never told anyone that he buried them under the cathedral, which had now transferred from Roman Catholic to Protestant hands, and were only found by accident 123 years later when the architect used explosives to destroy the old cathedral and created a great hole in the floor. And next thing, they found these metal chests. And when they opened up the metal chest, they called for the dean, of course. And when the dean came in, he saw beautiful images on them. And he said, look, these were obviously before the Reformation, which he was correct. But these vestments are the only complete set in the entire world of medieval cloth of gold vestments. They are stunning. I mean, it feels a little bit like we're in an episode of Game of Thrones, but these aren't props, are they? Uh, no, they're, they're not props indeed, no. This sword is very old. It, it dates to 1462. It was a gift of the King of England to the Mayor of Watford. It's got a symbolism that it's the sword to defend the city and it's the sword of justice because the mayor was the chief judge in the city and he presided over courts in, in the city. A few years after America won its independence, a small town up in County Wicklow had this mace and this will be in the museum and you can see it's dated to 1786. So it's around about as old as the United States of America. And that's again, one of the, one of the many, many highlights got the beautiful harp of Ireland on it then the coat of arms of a bishop, um, even though it's for a town, and um, he was the ruler of the town at the time. So this will be one of the highlights of the museum. No tour of this part of the country would be complete without a visit to the internationally famous Waterford Crystal. There's literally not a house in Ireland that doesn't have Waterford Crystal in it. How did it get so popular? I think the quality itself, it just yeah. speaks volumes. Because it's handcrafted, people do prefer to have that personal touch. The pressmen here, they'll collect, you can see at the back of the platform, there's a machine that will weigh out the large pieces. It's called a bibbit. So it gives an exact amount of crystal that the pressmen need to make each piece. But when it comes out, like I say, it's around 1300 degrees, but it cools down very quick. They have a very short window in which to get this piece made before the crystal will start to harden. If it starts to harden, it's no good. You've got to start all over again. Edgar, it is so mesmerizing watching the guys working and they make it look so easy as to you, but is it easy? No. <laughs> very, very skillful, very skillful job. It's five years then to finish our apprenticeships and then another three years to be a master. So last count now, I'm 36 years here. It just becomes part of the day. Like, you know, it's just, as it goes on, like your skill develops, it gets easier. I started when I was 15. How did you decide to get into glass blowing? My dad was in here, his brothers. And then when I came in, my brothers were in here. It's just like a family thing in Waterford, yeah. Just in the blood nearly. What are your favorite pieces to make? I like doing the small wine glasses, like Keith is doing behind us. You know, it's, it's kind of more skillful, faster. You know, the big stuff is great. It looks impressive, but I, I like the small ones. It must feel incredible when you see pieces, you know, on television or... or yeah, like last night looking at TV, there was a program on, there was a big piece of water with crystal in the background, and I just said, like, said to myself, I could have made that. You know, you see it all over the world, especially in the US. You know, it's fantastic now to see some of the pieces that you do actually know you made. The specific pieces like I only do here. So knowing when you see them somewhere else, you've done it like... At the beginning, we start with a batch, which is melted, of course, and into the furnace. Depending on what we're making, if it's wine glasses or large items. Large items, we get a specific amount of glass. So then you have to take it off a, an iron, and you begin to heat it in the glory holes up to a certain temperature. Then you take it out, start shaping it, dividing it, just making what you actually see in the mold, then into the mold, and hopefully comes out. Like, you're fighting against temperature the whole time. It's just getting colder and colder. So you just have to head down, get it in as fast as you can. The lifting is physical, like the glasses are, some of the big items, that thing that could be 28, 30 pounds. Yeah, you want to be standing in the air con, it gets <laughs> hot. Waterford is a special county with a really special history and culture with stunning coastal scenery, 
to inland mountain ranges. It's a place with something for everyone to enjoy. I hope you've enjoyed our journey through County Waterford and all the wonders it has to offer the traveller and anyone willing to explore. Join us next time as we continue our visit to Ireland, county by county.